All right, everyone. Welcome back to the land of Kemp. I'm your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. This is episode 102. And in this part one follow-up after our private special permission access inside the Great Pyramid of Giza, I will be discussing the anomalies and functions of the subterranean chamber. If this is the type of content you're interested in regarding the function of the Egyptian pyramids, please subscribe to the Land of Chem here on YouTube. Click that little notification bell so you do not miss the new episodes that premiere twice per week. Like, comment, and stay tuned. If you want to help support this channel, check out the Land of Chem members only section for exclusive research related content and unreleased footage that you will not see anywhere else. If you want to grab a copy of the book or pick up some merch, check out thelandofchem.com. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at thelandofchem. Also, check out our new channel here on YouTube, Egypt Eats, for spectacular food reviews from the amazing restaurants all across Egypt. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's intro. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, everyone, here we go with tonight's episode. And today we will be exploring the subterranean chamber, which is accessible via the descending shaft leading down into the bedrock of the Giza Plateau that you can see here on number four on this diagram. This chamber has a very unusual configuration with the eastern half of the chamber appearing to be finished with squared off walls and a ceiling, and the western half having a very rough, uneven structure filled with contours and protrusions. And here is another diagram of the chamber showing the inlet of the descending shaft here, the partially excavated pit here, and the very strangely carved bedrock area here on the western side. So before reaching the subterranean chamber, you must descend through this shaft that passes the well shaft located here. Now highlighted in red with the lower opening here, the so-called grotto here, and the upper opening into the grand gallery up here. And when we reached the recess outside of the subterranean chamber that you can see here, I noticed several things. A huge vein of iron oxide running through this section. Second, a big chunk of red granite. And third, a seemingly very out of place piece of white calcite crystal. However, it appears that there may have been some calcite crystal integrated into the original construction of the Great Pyramid, a detail of the structure that is often left unmentioned. And here on the right, you can see what the lower opening of the well shaft looks like today. And on the left, this excerpt comes once again from Keith Hamilton's Layman's Guide to the Great Pyramid, stating here that, quote, at the end of it, referring to the subterranean shaft, on the right hand is the well mentioned by Pliny, which is circular and not square, as the Arabian writers describe. The diameter of it exceeds three feet and the sides are lined with white marble." End quote. I think that by white marble, which has never been found or used in any Egyptian construction, they were simply mistaking the white stone that was actually white calcite crystal, a stone that was used abundantly in Egypt. And I will put in a clip now showing the moment that I noticed this small piece of calcite crystal in the recess prior to entering the subterranean chamber, and also showing that huge vein of iron oxide and the first piece of red granite. Iron oxide. Oh my gosh. Here, shine up. 
Four of the Great Pyramid. Do we have to go on our bellies? Nope. Oh, tight squeeze. Big fat vein of iron oxide. Okay. Still. That's out of place. Okay, hold on. So this piece of white calcite crystal may have come from an internal casing that once lined the well shaft, a very anomalous feature of the structure that is certainly deserving of more investigation. However, as you can see here, Further excavations into the well shaft are highly unlikely, as this area has intentionally been filled back in with rubble and trash. As with so many other areas across these sites that are worthy of more research. Now, onto the fragments of red granite that are strewn about inside the Great Pyramid, the first of which you just saw in that video clip. And I will read this second excerpt from the same work by Keith Hamilton, linked in the video description below. As far as I am aware, there are three granite blocks still residing in the pyramid. One, in the recess of the short horizontal passage leading into the subterranean chamber, which you just saw. Another, inside the pit of the subterranean chamber. This might be the block described by the Edgars further down the descending passage, but moved into the subterranean chamber. And finally, a block is to be found inside the grotto by the well shaft. The latter two appear to have holes drilled through them. I've been unable to find any detailed data about these other pieces of granite. And indeed, the second of the three chunks of granite is located in the pit, and it does have holes drilled into it, similar to the red granite slab that was discovered on the outside of the pyramid that you can see here. And it does appear that these fragments of red granite may be pieces from the three granite slabs that were once housed inside the antechamber, as described in Sunday Site Visit 26 and in Episode 100. And the holes are most likely related to the component that was fitted in these semicircular housings above the granite blocks, which in my opinion was absolutely not some wooden beam and rope pulley system. Only those who subscribe to the pharaonic burial theory are proponents of this idea, and the fact that the eastern wall of the antechamber is completely flat, a highly unlikely configuration for a rope and pulley system, is a very simple way to negate this proposed feature. Also, in every other instance across the Egyptian sites where tubular drill holes have been found, they were not holes for rope or wood, but rather they were housings for metal components. Now back to the subterranean chamber itself, which you can see here. The descending passage leads into the recess that you can see here, then into the main chamber itself here in the center. 
The partially excavated pit is here. And the dead end passage leading to the south here. And I will now put in another clip so you can see the chamber for yourself. Specifically, the eroded flow patterns leading down into the pit, the granite fragment from the antechamber found therein, and the contoured, protrusion-filled western half of the chamber. Flow patterns leading down. All right, now that you've seen the inside of the chamber, a few observations. First, it absolutely appears that the pit is not fully excavated. All of the original data shows that they only went down 36 feet. And today it is still filled with compacted sand. And I will say from personal experience that it appears to still be wet, an indication that there is a connection to subterranean water underneath this chamber. There are also significant erosion patterns that appear to be flowing down into the pit, which indicate that water was not flowing into the chamber, but rather out of the chamber from this pit. Second, what appears to be an unfinished western half of the chamber, as you can see modeled here, may be much more sophisticated and precisely engineered to promote specific fluid dynamics within the chamber. Which brings me to the work of John Cadman, who I'm sure you are all familiar with and has proposed that the subterranean chamber is a ram pump that produces complex fluid dynamics and pressures within the system. As you can see here, indicated in some of his drawings. This system then pumps water out of the subterranean chamber through this proposed outlet line connected to the dead end shaft. And the pit functioned as a waste valve distributing water back to the Nile River. This is an exceptional idea, and I will simply state how my theory is different than that of Cadman's. First, I agree with the conventional archaeology that this shaft leading out to the south is a dead end shaft which was engineered specifically to create a compression wave that forces water back up through the well shaft into the upper chambers to then be used in the chemical reaction sequence. One thing that John Cadman's work does not address is any connection between the subterranean chamber and the primary chambers inside of the Great Pyramid itself. Second, I do not think that the pit is a drain valve back to the Nile River, but rather propose that the pressure forces generated within this chamber were also designed to pump water out of the subterranean chamber and distribute them through a network of shafts across the Giza Plateau. And during my recent group tour to the plateau, we were accompanied by the lead inspector from the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities, the literal head guy in charge, the big cheese of the entire plateau pyramid complex as a personal escort for my tour, who corroborated on camera the existence of a subterranean shaft system that connects the Great Pyramid to other structures on the Giza Plateau. And I will be sharing this exclusive footage coming directly from the man in charge from the Egyptian government in a members only episode discussing the Sphinx enclosure. He confirmed several times for our group what has been anecdotally reported by Yusuf Awian and other locals for decades. The fact that all of these structures are connected via a complex network of underground shafts. So to summarize, the subterranean chamber of the Great Pyramid is indeed a pump chamber that was designed to produce compression that forced water back up into the upper chambers inside of the pyramid that was then utilized in the chemical reaction sequence to produce a dilute solution of sulfuric acid. It also had a secondary function to simultaneously pump water out of the pit, distributing it into a subterranean network of shafts connecting multiple structures across the Giza Plateau. And this image 
is just a teaser for another upcoming members only episode explaining the function of the Osiris shaft, which also shows a shaft system leading from the lower third chamber back toward and possibly connecting into the subterranean network below the Great Pyramid, which I also now have conclusive evidence to support. So please subscribe and stay tuned. All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. This was episode 102, The Anomalies and Function of the Great Pyramid's Subterranean Chamber. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. And in the next episode in the series, Sunday Site Visit 30, featuring the footage from this year's Land of Chem 2023 Ancient Alchemy and Ascension Tour, private special permission access to the Sun Temple at Abu Ghraib. This is a video you do not want to miss. So if you haven't already, please subscribe to the Land of Chem here on YouTube. Click that little notification bell, like, comment, and stay tuned. If you want to join on next year's tour, please send me an email, subject line 2024 Egypt Tour to contact at thelandofchem.com. If you want to support the channel, check out the Land of Chem members only section and the website. If you want to pick a copy of the book or grab some merch, if you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at the Land of Chem. Also, please check out and subscribe to Egypt Eats for food review content from all of the fantastic restaurants here in Egypt. Link in the video description below. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's episode. So I will see you next time. Yo, are you still watching this? Please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification button. New videos coming out every single week. And check out this other episode. Come on, do it. Do it now.